Was that not an awesome piece? They did great, didn't they? All right, so how many of y'all have a fireplace in your house or no? Yeah, yeah th th and this is Florida, right? Yeah. Right, all right. Yeah, because quite a bit of you, can, especially even compared to the early service, have a, we got that too. It's so like when we moved into our condo in 2017, we were going in and I'm like, well, how cool, there's a, there's a fireplace in here. Next question, um, I'm not gonna ask y'all because y'all have shut out. You have to guess how many times since 2017, has Richard used his fireplace? Anybody? Twice. Twice. We got a two. Three. Zero. Three, four. I see a four. Anybody else? Anybody else? Seven. The perfect number. No, but the right number is not once. Not once. Not once have I used that fireplace. Now, you know what I did with it instead? Let me, let me say, I have to confess. All right, so why do I not use the fireplace? Was probably the, the real thing, right? It, it's, it's, it's not just the heat, right? It is that, but there's moments where it gets cold. It's just so inconvenient. You know what I mean? It's like, you gotta get the wood. You gotta bring the wood in. You gotta get it into the fireplace, which is dirty. Then you have to get it lit. Anybody like that moment? Like trying to light the fire. So you're like trying to get the fire lit and then you have to keep the fire going. And then you have to clean up after you get done with the fire. And I'm like, I just don't want to do all that. It's just too much work for me to do that. It's like, oh my gosh. So, so how many of you have been camping, right? And you had fires there, right? And I, I, got, I love going around when you go camping and you, you get, gather around the fire pit and you're having s'mores and hot chocolate and having a wonderful time and the fire's burning all beautifully and keeping you warm on a cool night. And then the fire starts to lose some of its fire, right? And when it starts to lose some of its fire, it starts to smoke. And when it starts to smoke, it has an address and the address that it goes to is Richard. Anybody else have that problem, right? <laughs> where you're, you're like sitting there and all of a sudden the smoke's just like, and you're doing like this in your chair, right? And you're trying to, and then you start doing this, right? And you look like some weird, like limbo mania person or something, trying to get out of the fire. And then you have to get up and you have to do the Michael Jackson, you know, doing some kind of weird move to move your chair into a different location. Anybody, anybody? All right, so, so I've, I've solved that too, all right? Because when the fire's done, A, you have to keep putting wood on the fire. My brother-in-law has a, a little blower, like see, so they pull out a blower, no, pff, right, it blows up in fire again because it's getting oxygen into it. And you know what I'm saying, right? Yeah, all right, so, so he's got this little blower and it, it makes the fire all big, but eventually the fire starts to go out again and it starts to smoke and then you have to put water on it and it gets all inconvenient again. So instead of that, I had a solution for that too. Um, and the solution was a fire pit that's uh, propane, right? And so now when I go camping, I have a propane fire pit that I do, I know, I am so sad. I am so sad. <laughs> but, you know, Casey's talking about camping. I'm like, honey, you don't understand camping Richard style. This is not camping. It's what's called glamping, all right? You've all heard glamping, right? It is glamping. We are, we are just relaxing and enjoying. I turn the fire on and then I turn the fire off Done, done, it's over, right? Guys, it is so hard sometimes when, you, when you're thinking about fire and flame. One of the stories, we're, the story that we're looking at today is the story of, of Paul talking to Timothy and as he's talking to him, he's talking about this fire, this flame that's within him and saying, you got to fan it. You got to fan the flame. You got to bring the flame back. You got to rekindle as literally some of the words that he uses in order to bring it to life. And sometimes I think part of the reason he's having to do this, he's like the encourager, right? He's like encouraging Timothy that you got to, you, you've got to, you got to work the fire. You got to work on the fire that is, that is within you and to actually have that bring to life. And you, you can't run from it. You can't dodge from it. You can't get a propane tank. You can't do any of those things. You've got to tend the fire. So we're looking at 2 Timothy chapter 1, and here is what it says. I thank God. I thank God whom I serve as my ancestors did with a clear conscience. As night and day, I constantly remember you in my prayers. Recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I'm reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I'm persuaded now lives in you also. 
For this reason, I remind you, I remind you, Timothy, to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of hands. For the Spirit of God does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. The grass, I, I will get this out. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our Lord endures forever. That is right. I love how he puts this. I am reminded of your anipokrito pistios. I'm reminded of your sincere faith. That's what I'm reminded of. I'm reminded of your genuine, your sincere, your heartfelt, your, your non-pretentious, your, your, your nothing held back faith. A faith that isn't just belief. It's a faith that's lived. Timothy, when I look at you, that's what I'm reminded of. But then it turns in that one moment that you heard, and I remind you, right? And I remind you, in essence saying, don't forget. You need to remember that within you, that is there. What I saw in the past in you, you've got to keep working on it. You've got to what? Fan into flame, rekindle the gift of God, the sincere faith which is in you. You know the stories, right? You know the stories of scripture, like when, 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 the, when God comes into your life, when Christ comes in your life, when the Holy Spirit starts to fill you, the whole idea is that, that, that something happens. Something changes. You, you have this moment where it's like, oh my gosh, it's just incredible. And you, you might've had one of these moments in your life where it's just like, oh, and you felt so close to God. And somehow over time, what happens is, is, is we forget or we start to fade away and fade away and our fire's just becoming dimmer and dimmer and the smoke's getting up to try and warn us. And it's coming towards us saying, wake up, add more fuel to the fire, put another piece of wood onto the fire. You know those stories, you know them because if you know the story of Peter and Andrew, right? Peter and Andrew who, who experienced this life transforming moment, they come up, they encounter Jesus and they literally say, you know what? That whole nets thing that we're working on right now, the whole thing that relates to our income, to who we are, to our identity, to our livelihood, we're going to walk away from that. Matthew, Matthew, one of the other followers of Jesus. He's, he's sitting in his tax booth. Jesus, Jesus comes up. This is once again, his source of income. And what does he do? He literally walks away from the tax booth in order to follow Jesus. Life is changing something inside them and their faith, their sincere faith is coming alive within them to point that they're willing to walk away from it all for him. To walk away from everything that their, their identity, their income, all of it for him. There's a woman, there's a story of the, the, the woman at the well, right? The Samaritan woman at the well who comes up and she's listening and talking to Jesus and they're going back and forth and back and forth and he talks about water and living water and all this kind of stuff. And all of a sudden she's like, you know what? I gotta go tell my friends. She had come to that well. When she came to the well, she came with this jar to fill with water. She leaves behind the jar to be able to go tell people about him and saying, you've got to meet this guy. You know the story of Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus goes up in the tree. He comes down from the tree. He's called by Jesus saying, Zacchaeus, come down from the tree, right? You know the song, come down. And he comes down, he comes to his house and he's confronted by all these people who are saying he's eating with tax collectors and sinners. And right then that's when Zacchaeus stands up and says, you know what? 50% of all that I've ever made, I give it to you. I give it away. I don't just give it to you. I give it back to people. I, I just want, I want the world to be better because something has happened inside of me that I want to share with others. Story after story after story. Our faith, guys, is a no nets, right? Walk away from the nets. No tax booth. Walk away from the tax booth. Get out of the tree. Leave your water jar behind faith. And what Paul is saying is you want to have that faith back. You want to have any pocrito pistio. You want to have sincere faith, not just head faith. You want to have a faith that is practiced, that is brought alive in the world because it's been brought alive inside of you. And yet the reality is, and is, I'm saying for me, guys, I'm not standing up here like I do this all the time. Like I'm, ooh, you know, I've got faith that never is shaken. That's not me. I go through the same moments. I go through dips in my faith. I go through moments where, where the flame is fading and I'm not even noticing. Sometimes I go through moments where the, the flame is fading and I don't care. Can I say that as your pastor? Can I say that the, the, the sometimes faith is a struggle and you just don't feel like getting up to, to, to go fan that flame, to put another log on the fire? It feels like just one more thing added to the list of things that is the daily life. 
and it's hard for us to step out. But when you look at the stories of the, of the changes that happen in people's life, if you can remember, you heard it in the song, the very opening words of the song was like, I, I remember, right? I remember. That's this thing that you hear and hear. I remember. I remind you. In other words, remember, Timothy. Remember what it felt like. Remember how good it was. Remember how, how, how excited you were and the passion that you felt and the smile that was on your face that came out in a way that you couldn't even express because you had it for that short amount of time or maybe for a longer amount of time. But, but Timothy, you've got to watch out because maybe you're fading a little bit. And what they did was they kept pouring out and pouring out and pouring out and pouring out for the community and for one another. If you're familiar with the stories of early Christianity, it's like, you know, this, this, this group of disciples gets together and they, they start encouraging and supporting one another on their journeys. They go out two by two and they're getting supported by others in the midst of that journey because other people stepped up. You get into the book of Acts and the community is coming together and they're putting all their stuff together in common, all an expression of different ways of saying, I'm willing to walk away from all the stuff I got. I'm willing to walk away from even who I am, my identity, identity in order to follow him in order to follow him. Now, why am I talking about this? It's because it's Stewardship Sunday, and that's a day when when we talk about finances and to realize that that this isn't something we run away from. We don't run away from issues when it comes to, we don't run away from the hard stuff. We don't run away from the stuff that's happening in the world. We don't run away from the stuff that's happening in our lives. And I don't know where you're at financially, but I can tell you this, Jesus speaks to finances more than pretty much any other topic. If you look at his parables, more than 50% of his parables are about finances because he knows that, that this thing called money can draw you away and you can start to focus more on it than on God. You can start to focus more on it than on your friends or your community. You can start to focus more on it than even your own family. And that there was a danger in our finances as we walk, and we got to get to the place where that danger is sort of set aside, right? Now, you might say, because I get this frequently, I do a sermon like this about once or twice per year. And what I sometimes get is a person coming up, and what they'll say is something to the effect of, Richard, before you even get started, you need to understand, God has not blessed me with money. Anybody, right? You know? I was talking to my wife, Linda, um, and I said, honey, why did you marry me? Why did you marry me? And you know what she said? For your money, right? <laughs> That's what it was. It was for the money uh, because it clearly wasn't the looks, right? So it was clearly for the money. We didn't have money. We didn't have money. You've heard my story about that. I've lived in a pillbox of a, an apartment when we first started. You know, you, you, we're, we're only two people could sit at the dining room table that sat four, right? Because it had to be tucked in. I've talked about the, the door that opened the refrigerator. And when you open the refrigerator door, you couldn't walk into the kitchen. And it was just a dinky little place. Could I have afforded more? The answer is yes, I could have. I chose, we chose, Linda and I chose to say, you know what? Yeah, we can afford more, but right now let's not. Let's live in the pillbox while we're making back then $5 an hour, Right? And, and just to create a little bit of a buffer for ourselves, just to be able to create an opportunity that if something goes wrong, if a car breaks down, something like that, that, that there's resources there and I'm not constantly living up here. I'm not constantly living up here. And when we started that young, that has continued through our lives. I've never wanted to be in a place where, where I was so obligated to anything that I, I couldn't walk away. So we always made sure we worked our rear ends off in order to make sure we pay off our houses as fast as we could. You know what it feels like to be able to say, you know what, I can let that go because it's already paid for? The freedom that it gives and the ability to turn that not just into that, but into something else, to be able to get it to go even beyond that. So let me ask this question. How many of you want to be a millionaire? Anybody? 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 All right, we got about 12 honest people. All right, all right. Because a lot of times what we do is we look at scripture, right? And and it's like, uh, clearly, God doesn't want us to have money, right? God wants us to give all our money away, Richard. Don't you know those stories? Command those, I just turned back one page. So now I'm back in 1 Timothy. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in their wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command those rich people to do good, 
to be rich in good deeds and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. It doesn't say no wealth. One of those parables I was telling you about, the parables about, you know, the money stuff, one of them is called the parable of the talents. And you might be familiar with that parable. It's the parable where, where there's these three servants, there's a master, and as Jesus is telling the story, the master gives one of them like five talents. This is money, all right? So like a bunch of money. So here's five talents of money for you. Here's like two talents of money for you. Here's one talent for you. Um, each according to their capability, what they were capable of doing. So the amount, amount of responsibility. The one with five doubles it to 10. The one with two doubles it to four. The one with one buries it in the ground, all right? If you listen to the story, one of the points of the story is that God is giving you resources. That could be finances. And part of what you are supposed to do with your finances is grow them. God is not anti-wealth. God is not anti-money. God is anti-wrong use of money. Does that make sense? All right, so it's not, it's not that you can't attain to become a millionaire. The problem with when we think about being a millionaire is that when most people say that, what they're saying is they want to spend like a millionaire. I want to be a millionaire so I can get stuff. I want to be able to be a millionaire so I can get that car that I really want, that bigger house. I want to, I want to be able to, to, to get stuff that just, mm, just makes me feel like, oh, I'm all that in a bag of peanuts, right? You know, I've got it all together because I got this million dollars. The reality is, most millionaires, this is Dave Ramsey. This is what he says. A typical millionaire has a middle-class home, drives two-year-old or older paid-for cars, uh, and gets their jeans at Walmart. Does it make sense? Why does it make sense? It makes sense because they're seeking to live within their means in a way that they can make all they can. This is some language from John Wesley who founded the Methodist movement, right? To be able to make all you can, absolutely make all you can, save all you can, all right? Get to a place where you're actually saving some of the stuff that you've got and you're, you're actually putting that aside. And in the saving, that's growing up so that maybe one day you might become a millionaire and it's okay, right? So can, I have, can we have fun for a moment? Anybody? All right. We're going to have fun for a moment. All right. So I went shopping. I went shopping. Grocery shopping. How many have noticed the price of groceries? Isn't it great? All right. So I went shopping. This week, I went to Publix. I got me some Classico four cheese spaghetti sauce. I got me some Albronzo Barilla expertly crafted spaghetti for dessert. Magnum ice cream bars, huh? Yeah, everybody say, ooh, all right, all right. And so it doesn't rot your teeth, I bought some toothpaste, all right? Now, I've got my receipt from Publix. I paid for two jars of this, four of these, two of these, four of these, all right, four of these. And I also got some, uh, they had some like almond cashew type mix. And I bought them. What's one of the greatest things about Publix? It is BOGOs. Bogos. That's right. Buy one, get one freeze. All right. So the total for all the stuff that I bought on this particular day was $62.52. All right. These were six bucks a piece. All right. So from there, BOGOs, they were buy one, get one free. Buy one, get one free. Buy one, get one free. I found a coupon. All right. So... Buy one, get one free. Brought my total down to 32.27. All right, are you still tracking with me? Am I done yet? No, why am I not done? Thank you. That's right, I have coupons. I have coupon apps. Helen and I were talking about this. She was on my cruise ship with me yesterday, which is my kayak. We did the kayaking event. So Helen was at me and I told her I'd talk about this. All right, so. So I didn't stop there. Let me tell you how much I paid for these things, okay? So this was 339, 359, I lied. 359, buy one, get one free. So I got two for 359. That made them $1.80 a piece. There was a coupon on my phone for 45 cents off. So for each one of these, I paid $1.35. These were $2.59 each, I bought two. Um, they were not buy one, get one free, but they had a coupon in the, in the Publix app for $2 off, okay? So I brought the price down. 
On top of that, there was a $2 coupon on my phone for app for this that took off another $2. I paid 59 cents for this $2 and how much did I say? 259. So I paid 59 cents for this box. All right. These were buy one, get one free, $4.99. So half price means around $2.50. There was a coupon on Ibotta. I got that dollar off of each one. I paid 50 cents for a $5 thing of, of toothpaste. Are you tracking with me? Yeah. All right. Who wants a toothpaste? Anybody? Yep, I see a hand. All right, so uh, tech team, you can just light up the room because I'm going to be running around the room because I have to give stuff away. All right, so we've got toothpaste. And I saw the first hand over here. Oh, and it's a young gentleman who wants to make sure. Arm and hammer, give him a hand. All right. <laughs> spaghetti dinner. All right, spaghetti dinner, when I get this, this was under $2. This would feed Lynn and I twice, all right? So this probably won't quite make it twice, but it'd be somewhat close to be a little too watery. But you think $2, if you're worried about finances and food and feeding yourself, you could have done this deal. You can do this deal, right? So you buy a meal and it, at the very least, it might feed two of you in one meal for two bucks, a dollar per person. Pretty affordable, right? I already saw the first hand. So enjoy a spaghetti dinner on a Noni United Methodist Church. Right there, all right? Now, here's the sad thing. These, unfortunately, are fro- no, they're not gone, but they're not here because they're frozen, right? So I couldn't do anything with this. I just gave you Arm & Hammer baking soda toothpaste. I know who that voice was. That's right. All right, who wants an ice cream bar? I actually think I got Lisa's face over to her first. All right, that's okay. So it's empty right now, but I have a ice cream bar back in the freezer. So for you, so no, you hold on to this because I need it for the next service. All right, hold on. All right. Now, let me ask this. What does saving make possible? Oh, yes. Is it getting in here and here? Are you getting the point of, of when, you, when you save money, when you make money, the final thing that John Wesley steered us toward was make all you can, save all you can, give all you can. And we have this, this concept of the tithe right? Where, where it says 10%, 10% is outdated. That is not New Testament theology when it comes to generosity. New Testament theology is give it all and not, right? It's, it's, it's like take everything you've got and, and give it to God and watch what God can do with your stuff if you seek to be responsible. Once again, did, did, did Linda and I need to get these discounts? No. I can go buy this ice cream. I'm not in any financial hardship. You, I'm very generously paid. Linda has a job. She's generously paid. I don't have to. But that doesn't mean I'm not responsible for finding ways to save more money so that I can... I don't need to preach. You already know. And maybe... Like with Paul, we just need to be reminded that, that the call, guys, it, we laugh together as I handed stuff out, right? That's the weird thing. It's like we, you find when, you, when you're generous, when you give to other people, when you seek to do something for others, that, that there's this weird happiness that just starts to pervade the, the moment that starts to get inside of you, that starts to get inside of the other and suddenly you find yourself laughing and enjoying and having fun and it's just different and it's good. So it's just a matter of remembering. Remember who you are. Remember Paul's words, right? That, that, that you're called to be something different. There, there's this story in Mark's gospel um, that's talking a little bit about this whole idea. When I'm talking about the, the tithe is outdated, 
he, he has this moment where he's, he sees this woman and she's giving her last, in essence, penny away. And he uses it as, te- as a teaching moment and he's telling his disciple, he's like, do, do you see that? Do, do you see that woman giving her last? And you see, you see the people that have resources available to them and they're, they're putting in their 10%, they're putting in their portion. Which one? do you think is truly generous? Which one has given the most? Well, it's the woman with the widow's might. And the point isn't to say, give it all away. I think part of what he's trying to get across is it's not about the sum, it's about the percent. And as you're looking at your giving, we, we, we sent out the cards, so many of you probably already got these in the mail, I got mine in the mail, talking about pledging to the church and saying, you know what? There's this weird thing that happens when you pledge to the church. Your dollars turn into change. They literally, it changes into change in the world because you're being generous and and you get to celebrate. You get to hear Casey up here talking about the Halloween town and we get to applaud because there's 1.5 tons of food that we were able to collect. And we celebrate because of generosity and you get the feel goods and God's created us so that we get the feel goods because we're able to pour back out into the world. I'm gonna make a bold prediction. I'm gonna be an Old Testament prophet today because part of it is literally you have to plan. This is the reason these even come out. When you, when you think about giving, you have to plan your giving. You gotta prepare for it. If you're gonna do it and, and commit to it, then do it and commit to it. You have a plan for for what it's going to look like. You're actually looking at your finances. You're praying about it, saying, where am I at? What could I do as I move forward? And what would that look like? How how can I do that on a regular basis? Consistently having a generous heart. Consistently putting another log onto the fire when it comes to my financial side of my spiritual life. So you take that moment and you say, hmm, all right, I get to now pour out. My bold prediction is this. I'm going to ask you to maybe make a plan. Are you with me? Can we make just a small little plan together just to think about something that maybe you haven't thought about before? My prediction is that many of you in this room will have a moment in 2024 where there'll be a little bit of a a windfall of cash come into your hands. All right? Now, in the early service, one person said, yeah, we're getting a social security increase. That's not what I'm talking about. (laughs) All right? Here's my bold prediction. And you know I'm sarcastic, right? I don't don't read into this. The reality is many of you will get an income tax refund. Sometime before April, you're going to get an income tax refund. Have you ever thought that when that comes in, that maybe you should tithe? Even start at maybe 10% on that. You don't have to tithe the whole year. But you just think... Plan ahead now and say when that $500, that $1,000, that $3,000, whatever the number might be comes in, that I'm going to give 10% of that as a beginning practice for me. And that's my plan. It's money that's coming in that you don't know how much for sure it's going to be. And more than likely what we've done instead is we've already spent it. I want to be the millionaire. I want that new TV. I want that whatever. The calling that Paul's trying to get us to is to remember God first. And so we get the opportunity to make that plan. We are not meant, my friends, to have a faith that fades. We're meant to have a faith that is a drop your nets, walk away from the tax booth, come down from the tree, leave behind the water jar, inspired, filled, fire flame and like a flamethrower into the world faith. That's what Paul is calling us towards. And we get to practice that in all aspects of our life. Money is not exempt. If anything, if we're reading Jesus correctly and the frequency that he spoke about it, I don't talk about it enough. Let's pray. God, we have laughed and we've laughed because we shared. We heard about the food, the food that we collected, 1.5 tons, that in the course of this year so far, we've collected five tons of food for people in need. What would it look like, God, if, if we all pulled our little coupon apps and our BOGOs and we started realizing, you know what? 
I can sometimes do these deals not for me alone. I can actually give some more away. What if, God, I looked at my life and, and looked at my income and I realize inflation is running, but there's ways for me to be able to save money by cutting a few corners so that I can become more generous? Open our eyes, God, to our story, our individual story, whether we've got five talents, two talents, or one. And Lord, seek to honor you with whatever we've got. And in the midst of it, help us to be able to have those moments where we laugh and we smile because we're sharing spaghetti and toothpaste and ice cream bars around the fire that is just beautiful. We pray this, God, in his name, Jesus the Christ, the one who literally gave it all for us. And we all say, amen. All right. I would love for this to be the year we got more of these than we've ever gotten before. Will you make the plan? Will you make the commitment? I got this back. Lisa said, I'd like to give it to somebody else. Hands, there's my hand. <laughs> Sorry, already saw Tegan over here. <laughs> That's the heart, guys. That's the heart right there. Can you find ways to give your ice cream bars away? Generosity changed the world one time. And it can do it again. And it starts with you and I. God bless you. Go in peace and share your love. Amen.